We'll be starting the webinar at two minutes past 11, just to give everyone a minute or two to dial in. Okay, so we'll be starting the webinar in the next minute or so. So hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, which is focused on the 2023 outlook for supply chain logistics and real estate. We have a really exciting agenda scheduled for the next 45 minutes and we would love to hear you from you during today's webinar. So if you do have any questions as the panelists are speaking, please put those into the chat box. Any questions that you submit will remain anonymous. And then I will put those questions to the panel in the second part of the webinar. Just to also let you know that today's session is being recorded. My name is Kate Jones. I will be moderating today's webinar. I am Business Development Director for JLL within our industrial and logistics business. I've been with JLL for just over 18 months now. And prior to joining, spent a number of years at DHL Supply Chain and Wincanton. So I would now like to introduce our panel speakers for today. So firstly, we have David Ray. David is JLL's chief economist and has been with JLL for just over three and a half years and has spent a number of years prior to joining JLL at Jaguar Land Rover. David's role is focused on interpreting and translating what's going on in the world and what that means for JLL and our clients. So welcome, David. Thank you for joining us today. We also have joining Michael Peters. Michael is VP of Strategic Accounts at GXO and has responsibility for large omni-channel and retail accounts. And Michael has 15 years of experience working in supply chain and logistics. So welcome, Michael. And then last but not least, we have George Magee, who is the CEO of Mebec Consulting Group. George has been with Mebec since the 1990s, and Mebec is a supply chain engineering consultancy. JLL and Mebec have a global alliance, which has been in place for the last two years, and that is very much focused on bringing together Mebec's deep supply chain engineering expertise together with JLL's real estate expertise as well, so that we can offer clients end-to-end -end solutions all the way from supply chain strategy and design through to implementation into real estate. So if you would like to know more about that, then please do um, get in touch with me after today's webinar. Um, I'm now gonna hand over to David, who's going to provide us an uh, economic outlook. So David, over to you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Kate. And uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, next slide, please. So I've got 10 minutes or so to set the scene. And what I want to cover really is what's on this slide. If we look at what's going on in the world, what we read in the news, what we see in the newspapers, it's pretty uniformly negative. I characterize that as we are heading into a storm. Economic conditions are tough. But to my mind, that's not the whole story. There's more to it than that. And I think it's, it's important that in covering the economic outlook, I highlight why, why there is more to this story. And there's a couple of things. One, I think going into this slowdown or recession, depending on which country you're in, we're going so, we're doing so from a position of strength. The foundations for most economies are pretty strong. That doesn't mean there won't be pain, that there won't be uh, contraction or suffering, but it means that we've not got the vulnerabilities or the, the pressures that sometimes exist as we go into a slowdown that propagate or amplify a recession. So it's not likely to be as bad as it is in other, or as it has been in other recessions or other slowdowns. 
On top of that, policymakers have scope to act in the event of economic scarring, unemployment, insolvency. We've learned from the pandemic there are tools available. There might not be as much room for manoeuvre, but policymakers can act to mitigate some of this damaged cause, which when we bring it all together means that we're likely to see this slowdown or recession to be relatively short and relatively shallow by historical standards. And we can start to look for the light at the end of the tunnel already. Next slide, please. So I'm going to run through those concepts, those arguments in a little bit more detail. The first one is the, that we're heading into a storm. The economic environment is tough. Why? Well, if we look across Europe and if we look globally, there are four major headwinds. The first of which is COVID. It's very easy to forget in Europe or North America that this is still a big deal on a global basis, but it is. In some ways, positively, much of Asia Pacific are still loosening regulations coming out of COVID and the opening up is leading to economic acceleration. Now that's a positive and it means that we're not heading into a global debt, a global contraction because Asian growth is accelerating. But the downside of that really is China. China continues to operate its zero COVID policy. And this affects the rest of the world and affects Europe and us through two channels. One is directly through demand. So a much slower growing Chinese economy with, with shutdowns often at a moment's notice has a negative impact on demand for exports. Secondly, and more relevant for this audience, is the impact on global supply chains. China might shut down cities or factories or ports, uh, supply routes at sometimes a moment's notice. This creates huge uncertainty and an awful lot of cost, and this is having a negative impact globally. Secondly, I'm sure this will come as no surprise, energy. Energy is really the um, big driver of cost uh, and a huge influence or a huge amount of uncertainty into the outlook. And in fact, I would say it is the wild card, largely as a result of the Russia, of the war in Ukraine. If it gets considerably worse, then the energy shock will get considerably worse. If it resolves, then the energy shock will, get, will lessen considerably. And that could swing the outlook enormously one way or the other. But taking a central view, it's a big impact. And one of the big impacts is it's driving inflation. This is driving up the cost of living for households, the cost of operating for businesses, and diverting resources that would have otherwise gone on consumer goods or investment or um, uh, new supplies into just servicing those energy costs and those uh, a higher cost for existing resources. And then the fourth headwind really comes out of the inflation one. And this is central banks' response to high inflation. We have seen a period of incredibly rapid tightening of interest rates uh, across the US, across Central Europe, within the UK, a bit slower, a bit further behind from the Eurozone. But we are seeing a this substantial tightening is pushing up the cost of debt, pushing up the cost of funding, um, generally adding as a working as a as a weight on domestic economic activity, which is how it works to suppress inflation, but at the cost of slowing activity. Next slide, please. So when we look to the outlook, there's two things I would say. One, if you look at the um, dark blue, almost black bars here, this is the median forecast across a range of economists for what the outlook is. And what that's showing is there is a lots of countries that are expected to have either very low growth or a contraction in 2023. However, the bigger takeaway from this is those creamy brown bars, the length of which shows the distance from the most optimistic forecaster to the most pessimistic forecaster. So that's the full range of forecasts in the market. Now, at this stage, just a month, or these forecasts were from November, two months before the, um, the year ahead, this range is two to three, even four times for some countries, wider than normal. This is a huge amount of uncertainty. To have, for example, the most optimistic forecasters expecting 2% growth in Spain, and the most pessimistic expecting almost a 2% contraction, or similarly for Germany or the UK, a half a percent to 1% growth, but others thinking it's 2 to 2% contraction. This is, if not quite unprecedented, but incredibly unusual. 
and reflects the amount of fact that we are in this incredibly uncertain period and we know it's challenging we know there are lots of headwinds which i've touched on but we don't quite know how it will play out whether they will get worse before it gets better so that's that's this negative narrative that we we get and you can see why why that makes the papers but there's more to it next slide please as i said at the start the foundations for most economies going into this slowdown are pretty strong if we look at labor markets most labor markets across Europe are, are very tight, which puts a lot of strength in um, the hands of the worker. So we see multi-decade low rates of unemployment, high rates of employment, firms still recruiting. That's tailing off as we head into this downturn, but it's still positive. And this means that wage growth in other periods of recession would be running at zero, one percent, two percent at best is running at four, five, six, seven percent. It's not keeping pace with inflation. No, no, no doubt about that. But it's still pretty strong, which it wouldn't be if labor markets weren't so tight. And that means we're not facing a situation where a lot of households are already on the breadline, already struggling. And one thing I'm hearing through anecdotal or anecdotally, yet to see any statistical evidence, is firms might hold on to their workers as we go into this downturn, having learned the lessons from COVID. It's expensive to get rid of people. It's expensive to rehire people. And you don't want to be in the situation like the airlines and baggage handlers were over the last year and a half, being unable to get that staff when, they, when the upturn comes. Second and third, balance sheets are in a pretty good, if not stable starting position going into this. Household balance sheets are better off. Savings are higher. Net wealth is higher than it was before COVID. There's two things to take from that. One, there's, there's a cushion. It will deteriorate. This cushion will shrink. But households have that cushion to insulate them um, as cost of living goes up. Two, they're not already massively stretched as they have been going into other um, crises with being excessively leveraged. Similarly for corporates, corporate profits as a share of GDP is historically high. It will deteriorate, and I have no doubt that there are pockets of intense concern, um, small and medium-sized businesses that took on a lot of debt during COVID, now having to repay that debt and at much higher rates. But for the most part, across the corporate sector, balance sheets are pretty stable. And lastly, we do not face the vulnerabilities that we have done in previous crises. We don't have asset bubbles, house price bubbles, um, over leveraged households or businesses or an over leveraged financial sector that is on the point of a, a credit crunch. Those vulnerabilities have tripped up recessions in the past, made them deeper and longer. Going into this one, there might be things we haven't spotted, but certainly the regular culprits aren't there. Next slide, please. So if we look at, we know that some damage will be caused. There will be a deterioration. Policymakers have scope to act. What we've seen already is a lot of action on energy policy. Had this not taken place across most of Europe, we'd already be in recession and would have been struggling quite enormously. But with the uh, support for households, for businesses, for loans, subsidies, uh, price caps, different policies across Europe, that has provided insulation and it will continue to do so. Secondly, fiscal policy. Um, governments rolled out new fiscal measures during the pandemic. They could roll them out again if economic damage gets too high. There isn't as much scope for, for manoeuvre. Um, deficit levels are higher, debt levels are higher, but there is still that option for what was likely to be a short downturn. And then third, monetary policy. Monetary policy is tightening. It will continue to do so in many markets, but inflation expectations have remained low. And inflation, while peaking this year, or peaking around this quarter, is, is expected to drop continuously throughout 2023, giving central banks by the end of the year the scope to start cutting back on interest rates. And that's the general forecast across most economists. Next slide, please. So it raises the question, how bad is it going to get? And this is worth comparing to previous recessions. If you click, please. If we look at COVID, that was a very deep recession. And if I take a a swimming analogy or water analogy it was like falling into the Mariana Trench, peak to trough, 
14.4% contraction in GDP. And if you click global financial crisis, pretty deep, like walking off um, a beach into the deep ocean, 5.7% contraction in GDP. And then there are two other recessions, the Eurozone crisis and the 1990s recession, where it was around 1.9, 1 1.8%. If you can click again, please. So where does that leave the current crisis? Well, if you may click, it's got a similar sort of start of the profile, but most forecasters think it will be relatively short, relatively shallow, somewhere between a puddle and a pool, using my rather forced analogy, um, with perhaps 1.1% contraction peak to trough in GDP. And if we go to the next slide, when we look at how this plays out, it means that for, well, the UK already in recession, most European or many European countries in the midst of the first quarter of contraction. But as we look ahead, we can see that light at the end of the tunnel. There's the expectation that many European countries will be coming out in Q2. But if we, even if we take a more pessimistic view, coming out by Q3 means by the second half of next year, effectively six months away, we've got light at the end of the tunnel, growth is starting to return. Return slowly, but returning. Next slide, please. What does this all mean for real estate? Well, we'll certainly hear from, um, uh, sorry, we, we'll hear from Jorge and Michael in a minute about um, what it's meaning for them. But from a more generic high level perspective, one of the big factors is uncertainty. This is affecting decision making, be it um, when to renew leases, moving into new space, investment activity. The uncertainty is a huge negative factor at the moment. We've got the big increase in inflation, which is driving build costs, um, capital costs, having a big impact on operational expenditure, meaning people are having to decide, do they increase budgets or do they divert uh, or do they cut space? Similarly, pressure on capital expenditure with this great uncertainty about costs in the future. And because of the increase in a lot of um, construction costs, as well as cost of funding, it's causing investors and developers to reassess opportunities and risk, and in many cases, sort of step back till they've got more certainty about what's going on. Next slide, please. With that, I'd like to hand back to Kate, who's going to be leading the panel session, and I would reiterate her comments at the beginning. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to enter them in the chat box. Thank you, David. So you talk there a lot about uncertainty and around inflation and interest in decision making. So it'd be really interesting now to hear from our panel. So the first question that we have, which I will put to Michael and then over to George, is what are your business expectations for 2023 based on the economic outlook that David's just painted for us? And how is your business responding to that? Well, yeah. Um... They've already given us a, a quick uh, insight into the, the latest developments. And uh, for us in supply chain, warehousing, we see huge inventory levels. We see almost no space available uh, in terms of warehousing space. And uh, a partner of ours uh, or some of our partners have opened up to 15, 16, 17 distribution centers this year to be able to find a, a home for their products. Uh, and at the same time, we see uh, a decline in, in demand, volumes are going down, um, and there are no extreme peaks. I mean, it's always worthwhile having a look at what Amazon does. And uh, in the last quarter, they've been sitting on almost 30, almost 37 billion US dollars of merchandise, which has never been the case before. They introduced a new Prime Day in October, which was just another ordinary business day for them. So there was no no real peak, no real sellout for them. So uh, I see uh, this situation continuing as we move into 2023 for sure. I do see light at the tunnel, just like, like Dave explained, uh, but certainly um, that's, that's uh, the situation early next year still. Um, what does that mean to, to us and how is our business reacting? Well, uh, we need to be even closer to our customers, closer than we've ever been before. And I think when we when we take decisions, we, we need to stay very, very flexible. And most likely, we will not take long-term decisions, right? I mean, operational expenditure um, is, is, um, is key, and we, we need to take a, a look at, at that as well. And uh, uh, 
just like uh, Mibach, also we need to to consult uh, our customers in our businesses. So, Jorge, how how is the situation with you? Is uh, what do your customers need, and how do you consult them through these uh, these times? Um, thank you, Michael. Uh, maybe. Uh... I would like to do a reflection from where we are coming from. Yeah, we, we come from the COVID uh, recession. Yeah, and as uh, uh, David showed, this was a huge recession. Yeah, and uh, nothing is the same after COVID. Yeah, so uh, there was a, a big uh, um, postponement and cancellation of, of investments uh, during that time, and uh, many of them were released after after um, after the COVID. Yeah, uh, during the recovery times. Uh, it is true that the priorities of the companies has changed. Uh, now we're talking more about resilience, agility, digitalization, omni-channel transformation. And these are strategic investments that have a longer period. And these uh, investments uh, remain and continue because somehow they are very strategic investments that companies still believe in. Yeah? So at this moment of time, we see like two attitudes. Yeah, the the wait and see attitude. Yeah, and some companies are saying, okay, let's let's wait for one quarter, two quarters to take some decisions. And what we see overall is uh, somehow uh, uh, the complexity of making the right decision. Yeah, so um, decisions in the past uh, seem to be easier. Yeah, uh, now making the right decision uh, seems to be more complex. So there are much more uncertainty in the around the decisions. Yeah. And therefore, um, all these decisions, uh, the, the question is always flexibility, uh, and therefore maybe longer term commitments is an issue right now. Yeah, I say, okay, yes, but, uh, but give me the flexibility to change uh, short term. Yeah. Thank you for that, both of you. So I think one of the, the key things that we've also seen throughout 2022 is lots of supply chain disruption, um, which has impacted both supply chains and real estate. So it'd be really interesting to understand, do you see that worsening in 2023? And if so, what is that looking like for you and your business and how are you addressing those potential disruptions? Okay, I think uh, disruptions are here to stay. I mean, again, uh, the, the world uh, was uh, quite stable in the past and it is quite unstable right now. Um, and therefore, resilience and agility and contingency strategies are on the top uh, priority of most of the companies. Yeah, uh, uh, there will still be social unrest. Yeah, um, there has been, for example, a period in Latin America where a lot of countries had social unrest. Uh, social unrest in Europe may mean uh, strikes for different communities of professionals, etc. And obviously, these are also disruptions in the in the transportation market. There is a huge pressure on margins, and this uh, can also bring strikes. Then we have natural disasters. This is the climate change, yeah, and these are already disruptions for the supply chain if a part of the world is, is blocked because of a natural disaster. And, and also we have realized that there are supply chain uh, weak links, yeah, uh, the semiconductors crisis, um, the Suez Canal blockage, yeah, the, the food supplies out of Ukraine, yeah. Uh, this has shown that they, we are working, we are in a very globalized um, 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 economy and that there are some certain uh, bottlenecks. Yeah? Uh, now everybody realized that there are few semiconductors uh, uh, producers. Yeah? And then when there is a, a problem there, then we have uh, problems in most of the industries. Yeah? So, um, and I would like also to mention uh, one disruption that uh, may not apply to the whole economy, but uh, when it applies to one company, it is very disrupted, which is the cyber attacks. Yeah, uh, definitely if there's a cyber attack in one specific uh, company, this is a huge disruption for this company, not for the whole uh, industry, but uh, there's also risk associated with cyber attacks. Yeah? So how do you see this, uh, Michael, with your business and your customers? Well, certainly I agree with you, Jorge, that uh, the supply chain disruption is here to stay, uh, and there are just too many uncertainties uh, and, and implications on our business. I don't know if it will get worse, because it is quite quite bad already, uh, and there are many challenges, um, but certainly um, we, as, a, as a, a service provider in logistics, are impacted by um, labor availability, so there is less and less people available, um, and uh, there is also, as I mentioned before, little space available uh, where we can perform our services. Um, and, and thirdly, the equipment needed to perform uh, our services are also um, 
uh, taking longer to procure. And I'm not only talking about technology and automation, but there's much more that you need to, to run a business in, in logistics uh, or supply chain. And, um, and thirdly, the uh, fourth element is the lead time. I mean, waiting times to start working, to implement a project, to go live with new new ideas will also take longer and longer. So how do we react to this? Well, luckily, um, we do have already uh, some automation, some te technology in place that we can use to the highest degree possible. Uh, wherever possible, we also try to combine businesses um, at our campuses, so uh, we cannot afford to have underutilized warehouses uh, these days. Um, so that's that's one one element where we where we try to share infrastructure across um, possible uh, multiple businesses. We also, uh, when talking about automation, um, refer to um, robotization, and you can see in my background some robots uh, lifting shelves that move around the warehouse. So. This is easily uh, transferable to another site, so we can help um, others, colleagues, businesses as well by not uh, removing a complete warehouse, but taking elements out of it. So in, in a nutshell, we need to be creative and, and creativity doesn't stop uh, with potentially collaborating with partners, even our customers in, in new constellations where space is scarce and, and somebody on the market um, has, has availability. So we would partner up with people we would not think about before um, just to be able to cover the demands. Um, so this is more or less um, a very flexible way uh, of, of doing business and a very creative one at the same time, I would say. Perfect. So I think some of the key themes from 2022 that we've seen are rising inventory, and you mentioned that earlier on, Michael, um, a lack of warehousing, which is a real challenge, rising construction costs and labour availability. So given those key themes, what impact does this have for you from a real estate perspective? Well, first of all, there are few buildings uh, or warehouses being built speculatively. So there are a few, but uh, in, in the coming year, we, we won't see them um, any longer. And um, as a matter of fact, there is a short term demand that you have to uh, to address. And uh, so it's getting uh, it's not getting easier. Um, so an immediate demand uh, is, is it cannot really be fulfilled. And um, then uh, long-term or dedicated projects are more or less on hold, uh, as you as you are aware of uh, the rising cost, uh, inflation, interest rates. These huge and large projects uh, need to be financed, and um, there is um, yeah a blocking point in in there. Um, we might start a discussion, um, a new discussion, or maybe uh, an everlasting discussion about having higher buildings. Uh, by utilizing the height of a building rather than uh, enlarging the footprint of, of new distribution centers. I wouldn't call it a trend, but there is definitely a tendency in utilizing the height of the building even more uh, and to go beyond the typical 10 or 12 meters to go even higher than 18 meters. But that's also a very individual decision, uh, business by business, that, that needs to be taken it's not eligible for, for everything, but there is, uh, I would say, a, a tendency um, in, in doing that. And um, so there is um, a couple of, of, of um, perspectives on the real estate market I, that I'm able to share. Um, Jorge, is there any, anything you see with, with your customers? Uh, do you also see the, the, the um, rising height in the buildings, or is there anything else you, you can share with us? Yeah, I, I think that there are uh, two main trends that uh, might be affecting the real estate. Uh, one of them is uh, the, the huge growth in omni-channel and e-com. It is true that pure players had a huge hype during COVID and now they're going back to normal, the case of Amazon, yeah. Uh, uh, they, they raised a lot of the expectations. Now uh, they, they are lowering their, their growth expectations. But uh, traditional retailers are, are still on the on the growth path uh, on 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 ecom, yeah. Um, and then uh, on, uh, there is also the the need for automation. And, and 
there is still labor scarcity on on uh, on the markets. Yeah, it is very difficult to to find uh, people that uh, want to work in in, in workhouses. Uh, it's not a, an easy job. Uh, many times there are also labor regulations that uh, that uh, need to be applied, and therefore there is a, a huge uh, trend on on automation. Yeah, and, and this brings uh, this idea of. Um, uh, on the one hand, we may have a tendency on micro um, centers, distribution centers, fulfillment centers close to to, to the city centers, etc. On the other one, and uh, mega distribution centers where we want really to compile um, uh, volumes and, and be able to better automate. And there is where um, high bay warehouses or, or bigger um, and uh, higher higher workforces uh, would would have, play a role. Yeah. Whilst in on the micro uh, fulfillment centers, it's the other way around. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, close to to the cities and uh, normally not uh, not very high buildings. Yeah. Thank you for that. So we've talked a lot about uncertainty and some of the challenges it will face. Be quite interesting now just to think about growth. So if you can just talk to me a little bit about in your client industries where you see growth opportunities happening in 2023, but also where you maybe see things not growing or flatlining and what that means for your business. Well, um, you may say that GXO uh, um, and our business is, is active in many industries and so am I. So I see a uh, different world, so to say, and uh, you may say in general that discounters these days, um, as people save, um, may be very, um, very successful. At the same time, you could call the fashion industry on a declining path. Um, I think that that's that's fair to say, but um, overall there are differences uh, within those uh, industries. So where do I see growth um, opportunities? Well, definitely um, with uh, brands and retailers or businesses offering af affordable project uh, products. People still want to shop uh, online as well as offline, but overall um, they have uh, less money to spend. So um, that's simply. Um, at least across our business, where we see um, an increase uh, with with those those companies. At the same time, uh, and that has happened during the COVID crisis and lockdown, but is still very very um, yeah uh, available and and active. The, um, the the personal care, fitness, well being brands where you do something to your uh, body quite personally is still a very successful business. Um, and then. Brands and retailers going abroad on an international route, and uh, we are a global company, so we take customers um, across um, the, the globe. And um, by internationalization of the business, um, there is um, as well a huge, huge growth um, potential available for for many, uh, many brands. And then there are also um, businesses declining, Me Too brands, and here we have fashion um, companies a lot uh, where you have uh, high competition, where you have high customer acquisition costs. Um, so those businesses are, are struggling a lot. And I think um, you, you can ask the question, um, who will survive um, sitting on high in inventories, not selling well throughout, let's say, the winter time or the coming months? I believe there are um, the, the businesses that are successful who can do that by not um, discounting their products, potentially harming their brand and brand recognition. So um, it is a, a diverse field, but there are, uh, I would say, winners and, and losers uh, in, in the coming months. Perfect. And George, maybe if you give your perspective from me back in terms of, you know, the industries where you're seeing growth, working on more projects, what that looks like. Yeah, the thing is, um, I mean, there are industries that are clearly very much affected by new business models. Yeah, if you imagine now the automotive industry, yeah, with the shift to uh, other type of uh, energies, yeah, and it's not yet clear who, uh, which will be the winner. Plus the possibility of uh, renting a, a motorcycle uh, in the middle of the city for one hour and, and then leave it on the corner. Yeah. So you can imagine uh, these type of companies that are manufacturing these uh, these uh, vehicles. Yeah. Uh, they they live very uncertain times. Yeah. And um, on the other hand, um, 
I would focus on 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 the supply chain projects because uh, maybe one industry is suffering, uh, but the complexity of the supply chain is getting uh, uh, bigger, and therefore they are still investing. Yeah, and uh, there I would put the, the whole omni-channel uh, trend. Yeah, uh, where maybe the business is not running uh, um, or growing as it, as it was on the past. But the supply chain is getting more and more complex because uh, then you really have to go uh, different routes to markets uh, that are more complex, more fr uh, fragmented, and therefore you have to heavily invest in, in supply chain. Yeah. Um, so we, we still see a lot of investments uh, um, in new business models, omnichannel, uh, and the last uh, would be um, digital transformation also, yeah, but this is uh, bas basically not so much related to, to real estate. But sustainability, yeah? I mean, uh, sustainability somehow uh, was always in the agenda, but nobody has taken this uh, very seriously. Yeah? Uh, uh, and now I think now uh, companies will take it seriously because of the pressure of the consumers yeah? uh, uh, that at the end are the buyers of the, of the services and products. Yeah? Uh, this will really change. And also the policymakers, yeah? the regulations. And therefore, uh, um, when it comes to real estate, yeah, uh, uh, new buildings, uh, um, uh, certified sustainability, certified, etc., uh, definitely uh, will grow in terms of interest. And maybe there is a need also to uh, release um, old uh, non-sustainable buildings, yeah. And therefore, there is a, a change in the somehow the the, um, the inventory of, of buildings uh, because they have to be renewed uh, to make them more sustainable. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. So um, I'm now going to just have a look through what questions we've received from the audience and then I'll put those to the panel. So if you just bear with me for a moment, I'm just going to get those up. Um, there's a lot of discussion around nearshoring, deglobalization off the back of the pandemic. To what extent have your businesses considered adjusting, if at all? So maybe Michael, you want to answer that first? Well, uh, reassuring. Um, we, we see that with uh, with our customers a lot. There is uh, a trend to to um, bring production uh, closer to um, corporate markets, to key markets. That's for sure. Do we see that? Um, in a, a, is that a strong trend? Not yet. Uh, simply because businesses have evolved over decades, uh, and uh, there are um, um, there is an infrastructure in place that you cannot um, change as as rapid as the pandemic or the crisis hit us globally. And there is also know-how transfer that you cannot um, move into other areas of the world within such a short time frame. But certainly, uh, we everyone tries to do that. Everyone tries to have a different setup long term. It just takes time, uh, and uh, I would say we're in a in a trial phase right now because whatever you do, uh, uh, you you need to test and and learn, um, and you don't want to to affect your your business by 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 testing. Um, so you have to have your backup solution, um, and that is simply um, yeah the situation as it has been before before the crisis as well. Yeah, but I would agree, Michael, that uh, uh, nearshoring is is really also on, on the priorities of companies, and it, it takes time because you cannot build a factory. Yeah, uh, but uh, uh, at the end, uh, there are two key drivers for nearshoring. One of them is uh, sustainability, and if your customers say, "Why are you purchasing for so so many miles away from here?" Yeah, why don't you uh, procure or, or, or source uh, locally or, or or nearby, yeah, and the other one is resilience, yeah, and we, nowadays, yeah, um, and the, the Canal de Suez uh, brokerage uh, was, was a clear example, yeah, and, and goods coming from Asia were blocked, yeah, if they would have come from, from a nearby country, there wouldn't have been a problem, yeah, so um, resilience and sustainability is driving the, uh, the near shoring initiatives, and it takes uh, time because you cannot build uh, capacities from one day to the other, and also you want to build them that they are competitive yeah and competitiveness comes with automation because obviously there are uh, lower lower cost countries so automation needs to be uh, included in the equation but also um, again agility yeah uh, nearby means uh, uh, flexible and fast 
Thank you for that. So, George, maybe one for you as well. So, how will the increase in fuel costs impact on locational choice for logistics users? Well, uh, at the end, uh, there, there has been a, a clear trend on on um, reducing footprint, number of nodes in 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 in, in the networks, yeah, and centralizing. Um, now there is another trend which is coming back uh, closer to to the end customers. And this is driven by uh, um, omni-channel needs, uh, as, as I mentioned, but also due to transportation. Yeah? Uh, so um, long-haul transportation, primary transportation can be made much more efficient than, uh, than secondary transportation, uh, because there you have the whole fragmentation of customer orders, etc. So I think, um, well, first of all, yeah, intermodal transportation, uh, platooning of trucks, uh, new different type of energy sources for transportation, etc., cetera, et cetera, will 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 be there. Yeah, but uh, but also we are we are going back to a more decentralized uh, uh, network, and the, let's say the disadvantages of the decentralized network is somehow overcome with the whole digitalization and having a much more let's say smart. Uh, inventory uh, deployment, for example, yeah, which was one of the pains uh, of, of having a more decentralized network. Thank you. Michael, do you want to add any comments to that? Yeah, well, I, just, uh, I can confirm. I mean, the decentralization we see also with many of our businesses having three, four, even five distribution centers only within the European Union plus the UK, I have to admit, uh, is is uh, key to success for, for many um, customers of ours by being closer to their customers, be it end consumers, be it retail, wholesale. Um, and um, by, by this, um, we I wouldn't say that the fuel costs really have um, an impact on that decision making. I think it's, it's overruled by other factors, but it may here and there also have um, a saving potential um, as we look at uh, what is not warehousing related, the supply chain, the transportation, the last mile delivery, and then also the, the way products make back into the warehouse by returning. So um, that is, is, is my response. Thank you. Um, I can see the word inflation. So I think this definitely is a question for David. Um, will inflation really fall back? Haven't economists and central bankers been underestimating for most of the last two years? Well, that's definitely true. Uh, economists and central bankers have been massively underestimating it. And in part, it's because we just haven't had really high inflation for a very long time. So models that have been built on the basis of inflation over the last 20, 25 years, perhaps even slightly longer, just can't cope with with inflation now soaring and being much higher than it has been for a long time. So that's just led to, oh, it'll fall back, it'll fall back, it'll fall back, which is why so many central banks, or certainly the major central banks, were late to raising rates to try to, to contain inflation. Those in Central and Eastern Europe were far ahead of the curve and moved much earlier and much more substantially. But will inflation now come back down? Well, I look at it from two perspectives. One is external prices over which uh, central banks have no control. And then there's the domestic economy. And from the external side, we've seen a huge rise in a lot of prices, but we've seen some drop back. So uh, gas prices, coal prices have hit a peak and fallen back a little bit. Um, metals prices, agricultural, so wheat, um, ha, uh, went up enormously following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but have fallen back and are now 10, 20 odd percent below where they were before that invasion. And even oil is a little bit below where it was before Russia invaded Ukraine. So from that respect, you've got two pressures. One, um, you, it, if we're not seeing further upward pressure, further upward movement in commodity prices, which means that year on year change that increase that we're seeing will drop out of the annual uh, comparison, which has been driving inflation rates, to where we've seen prices fall back, that will have that negative effect and suppress inflation. And that's imported inflation. On the domestic side, you've got two factors driving things there. One, um, 
effectively the cost of living crisis. That is meaning people are and businesses are diverting funds to pay for their energy, to pay for the necessities, which means less driving other things, which means less domestic demand pressure on prices. Secondly, the increase in central bank interest rates will put downward pressure on domestic demand and domestic prices. And now that they are live to it and live to the risks of inflation, which they were slow to act on, they're going to keep raising until inflation is clearly coming back down. So although I think I completely accept the charge that economists were massively undercalling inflation, and I was one of them, now it has gone so high that they feel credibility is on the line. They have to act and will continue to act to suppress domestic demand, keep pushing inflation down until that has been achieved. But that ignores the, the cost of which is lower economic activity, um, lower demand for credit, and in some cases, exacerbating uh, recessionary pressures. Fantastic. Thank you, David. And I think we've probably got one more question, time for one more question. So um, I'll read this out and then whoever wants to jump in can jump in. So. Could autonomous driving trucks have a huge impact on the total supply chain and specifically location of warehouses in the future? Maybe I give my view. Uh, the answer is uh, yes, because the, the, the cost of, of the driver and also the scarcity of drivers. Yeah, we, we can still see the pictures of the army uh, driving trucks in the UK, yeah, uh, which was a very specific case, but uh, there is scarcity. This, this is a, a profession that nobody wants to have. Yeah, it's uh, it's not very uh, nice profession. You would to spend one one week away from home every day, every week. Yeah. So yes, um, the transport uh, will will be lower. Yeah, uh, uh, and therefore you can. Uh, Again, this tendency of having a mega distribution centers and then micro distribution centers. So a decentralized network closer to to the where uh, to the demand uh, where you have the secondary chain distribution, but then primary distribution uh, might have a, a longer leg. Yeah, and therefore this longer leg, either with platooning, with uh, with uh, mega trucks, uh, with intermodal transportation, and definitely autonomous uh, trucks. Uh, will be uh, the cost uh, will be lower yeah. fantastic anybody want to add anything to that just before i wrap up the audience questions can i just sort of add an extended extension yeah. to that question um would it not be it's greater automate automation of the the warehouse facilities themselves combined with automation of the trucking that will make that big difference to location of logistics assets because as you said Jorge if you're if you're struggling to get drivers and you're struggling to get warehouse operators and that's one of the key decisions of where you locate because do you have the staff can people get there if you get to the point where you've got truly autonomous or largely autonomous warehouses and trucks it opens up a whole new um range of locations which at the at this point in time would be completely inaccessible yes you're right but at the end uh, you may automate a lot but still you need a uh, unit maintenance people etc maybe they are not so conflictive uh, as other workers but uh, you will never get rid of people and uh, there is a, a theory that uh, robots will pay taxes at one moment of time anyway yeah maybe they don't uh, unionize themselves and they don't make strikes yeah, but but then the shift is about the uh, best taxation of automation and robotization. Yeah, uh, but I think we are we are still uh, a few um, yeah probably one decade away from from this uh, vision that everything can be automated. But but uh, this is not so long uh, long ahead. Yeah, uh, and uh, I would make a clear distinction between automation, traditional automation with a lot of conveyors and machines, uh, and robotization. Yeah, which is much more. Uh, scalable uh, and therefore much more flexible also this is what uh, michael has behind his uh, his head yeah the the picture yeah these are, are all robots yeah and these are basically a, a different way of automating yeah? perfect okay so uh, we're heading on for 10 to 12 so i'd just like to thank the audience for submitting questions we've not managed to answer all of them so we will come back to you after the webinar with um detailed answers on those um, thank you very much for engaging. Thank you to the panel.
Um, I'd just like to ask everyone to give their sort of closing comments before we close the webinar down. So, um, David, if I maybe start with you. Certainly. Well, I think from an economic perspective related to industrial and logistics, I would say we've got a cyclical slowdown, but otherwise on a stru strong structural upward trend. I don't see any reason to think that logistics demand supply will be going in the opposite direction anytime soon. This short term slowdown in demand affecting retailers, meaning they've got greater stock and slowing demand for space isn't likely to last. I think come middle of next year, we'll be looking out the other side to that cyclical upswing. Fantastic. Thank you, David. Michael? Well, my, my closing comment would be, uh, and I can't say that often enough, stay flexible in, in your business, have a short term view um, as um, there are daily disruptions across the supply chain. I'm not saying forget about long term strategy because the crisis here also opens up new opportunities. Uh, some we have discussed today, but um, stay close to, to your business, um, be as flexible as possible to accommodate um, the changes affecting your, your business on a daily basis. Brilliant. And then last but not least, George. Yeah, I, I agree. This, this is a crucial moment uh, full of challenges, but also opportunities. And I like uh, one saying that says, uh, when the winds of uh, change uh, blow, some build uh, walls and other windmills. Yeah. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, there, will two, there will be two types of companies here, the ones that are more, let's say, uh, well, the, the ones that have the, the right to take the right decisions and build the, the windmills and take the opportunities and the ones to, who are really uh, building the walls and, and trying to protect and, and maybe they lose opportunities also from the market. Yeah, so it's not an easy moment to take decision. This is clear. Yeah? I think this is the underlying uh, topic. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So just a thank you again to the audience for your questions. Um, a massive thank you as well to um, our panellists today. Really fantastic discussion. We hope that everyone that's joined the calls found it insightful. And if you have any specific questions, please do get in touch and we're happy to arrange any follow-ups. And I will now close the webinar. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.